All right. Let's see. We have people looking for seats still. We good? We find them now, baby. Hey, welcome to Anne. Thank you so much. Uh, we're glad you're here. Easter Sunday, we've got their Easter best on. Man, no other time in the year do we wear this many pastel colors, right? <laughs> it's because it's he has risen, my friends. Like, I don't wear this shirt any other day of the year. You think I want to look like a popsicle? No, I don't want to look like a popsicle, but here's the deal. He has risen. He has risen. It's why we celebrate Easter. It's why we get dressed up. It's why we put our kids through psychological damage to take pictures with creepy bunnies, right? You ever notice? You ever notice how weird looking the bunnies are? I mean, this one's kind of like a serial killer from the 50s, but do you ever notice how, I, I'm just, it's not any better nowadays. That one, I definitely would, I would get out of line for. It's not, it doesn't get any better. I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you, I'm going to make a petition that no more creepy bunnies on Easter. Right? I know they try to make them look like they smile, right? And, and we wonder why the kids are like, no, right? We're like, do it, it's Easter, right? I want a picture for the gram. And so we make them sit with these creepy bunnies. So I'm just telling you, listen, I don't ever do this. In fact, you know, you know when you walk out of Target or Walmart, like, hey, hey, sir, can you sign something? I'm like, uh, I don't care what it is. I don't care if you're like signing for a million bucks. I don't want to do it. I'm going straight to my car. But if somebody walked up to me outside of Target on the way out and said, hey, I got a petition, no more creepy bunnies. I'd be like, I'm in. Where do I go? I'm signing that bad boy because that is, that is, what we need to get rid of in 2024, my friends. 2024, I'm petitioning right now. No more creepy bunnies. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm saying. Hey, we're glad you're here. Welcome to Anthem. We're going to be talking about the resurrection of Jesus today because we believe there's power in this story. We believe this story changed the world because he has risen. And because he has risen, let me tell you what that means. If you've placed your faith in Jesus, you have experienced ultimate victory. And you know what victory feels like. Victory feels like that game-winning shot, right? Three, two, one, release. Swish, and Butler sends the Aztecs to the championship. <laughs> you guys know that feeling? San Diego finally knows that feeling. Let's not talk about that. Whose kid is that? <laughs> or or it's, it's, it's when you put chefs in the room, right? You don't even need a recipe, but put it aside. It's when you just put that little salt bay, you put the perfect amount of seasoning on that steak, and you serve it up, and you're watching your guests enjoy that meal. That's what victory feels like. It's the crack of the bat, and the whole crowd knows what it's going over the fence it's that feeling when you walk down the aisle and you know you know you got the right one one all there's one romantic everybody else is like <laughs> watch too many lifetime movies in my gym it's watching your kid at the playground show a random act of kindness for no reason and you as a parent, you're like, yes, I'm doing okay. <laughs> it's making the final payment off of your debt. You're like, I don't know that one. <laughs> Victory. It has a feeling, doesn't it? Last night, I'm a big UFC fan, and after the main event, the guy had finally conquered the guy that had beaten him three times in professional fighting. And after, you know what he pleaded into the camera? You know what he said to the camera? He said, I wish everybody behind the screen could experience this feeling one time. One time. What is it? The feeling of victory. And here's what's interesting about the story. We, in hindsight, get to see all of it. We see the back story. We, in fact, the gospel covers, all four gospels cover the resurrection story from four different accounts. It's fascinating. It's beautiful. 
there are different audiences that they're writing to, and so they cover different angles of it because they know that who they're writing to may need this particular part of the story or, or, or this piece or, or this would be interesting. When you put it together, you get the resurrection story, and we read that in collection, and we see all of it. But listen, we're entering into a reality that's much, much different. We talk a lot about Good Friday. We talk a lot about Resurrection Sunday. But how about Holy Saturday? You know what Holy Saturday is? Holy Saturday is that moment in time when you're going through the worst day of your life, worst week of your life, worst season of your life, right, where you're feeling like, man, you can't get out of bed because ultimately there's something happening chemically in you. Uh, man, maybe, maybe you're dealing with house stuff. Maybe you just got uh, laid off. You're, you're, when you're looking to the heavens, the only question you're asking is what? Why? There's confusion and frustration, depression. That's what Holy Saturday was. Where we enter into the scene is not where everything is all figured out. It's not when everything's all buttoned up in pastel colors. We're entering into the scene where, the, where there's tremendous amounts of confusion for the Bible characters in the story. And what I want you to see today in the resurrection story, because we can talk about the power and we will, but there's another aspect of the story that's really interesting in his appearances and in those appearances, it brings to light the, the defense of the faith. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, there's different types of people in the room today. And I don't want to put you in a category, but I am. You're, you're more than likely, you process information either through more of a thinker or more of a feeler. Now, that doesn't mean that thinkers don't feel, and all the feelers are like, yeah, it does. And it doesn't mean that feelers don't think, and the thinkers are like, definitely they don't. What it means is you primarily process information through one of the two of those things. Maybe you're more balanced, but typically you process information. And this is a chaotic scene. And how Jesus appears to each of the people in the story, they're different, but the greeting is the same because it speaks to both the thinker and the feeler. If you have your Bibles open up to Luke chapter 24, I don't want to give away the greeting. I don't want to give away the story. But it's different than just the powerful side of Jesus. Anybody that can uh, come back from the dead is powerful. I've done a lot of funerals. I've never done a resurrection one. I've never, done, uh, uh, never been invited to a re resurrection service. Or even, I, I mean, my numbers are out there. I'm, I'm willing. If somebody called me, I, I'd be the first one there. That would be exciting. I don't want to be a part of the second guy to ever come back from the grave. But Jesus is the only one. And so every year we have to celebrate the same guy. Because he's the only one that has done it. So the power is in the story, but it's not just this power that we read about today. Through the separate experience, uh, appearances that Jesus will have, we'll both get a defense of the faith, but we'll also get an aspect of the story that isn't often covered. Luke chapter 24, if you're there. If you have your Bibles, uh, you can open up there. You can also use your phones. You can even go to the App Store right now and download the Bible. It's a little brown icon and read right off your phone. Also, we always have the verses on the screen. Luke 24, here's the resurrection story, focusing on the appearances that Luke covers. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the woman took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. So this is a common uh, thing that you would do. It would be like a gravesite visit. Listen, Jesus is dead, and the disciples are bummed, depressed, frustrated, probably feel like they've given their life to what? They left their careers for who? Just another dead guy, like everybody else. But the ladies, the ladies in the story, show up to Jesus' tomb to honor him. Because even though it appears like he's not who he said he was, he still meant something to them. Verse 2, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. 
this would be a massive endeavor to try to move this stone. I don't even know how many guys it would take. But when they walk up, it's rolled away. Now, preparing spices, normal. Stone rolled away, not so normal. So the story begins to pick up. Verse 3, but when they entered it, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. We call them angels. And when angels show up on the scene, you're going to see what you often see. Anytime there's a supernatural experience, anytime there's a uh, supernatural interaction, there's what? Fear. So it says, and, and I, I want you to, if you're taking notes, if you love to mark up your Bible, right, just, just make a note of fright. In their fright, the woman bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men, or the angels in this case, said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinner, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. And maybe if you're a Christian in the room and you struggle to remember God's words, maybe you need to circle, highlight, underline, just to encourage yourself. The people in Scripture also forgot. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the others. Remember, there's 12 disciples who followed with Jesus, but we lost Judas at the end of Jesus' life, and ultimately there's 11 primary apostles left and then several other disciples. So it's first him appearing to who? It was Mary Magdalene in verse 10, Joanna, and the Mary, the mother of who? Who's James? The brother of Jesus. So this is fascinating, the three women that he decides to appear to. At least the three women that the Bible decides to name. The first has a crazy story. You ever been to church and they show like a really dramatic video of a crazy story and you're like, holy moly. That person should be in prison, first of all, right? And second of all, how amazing that God has redeemed and restored them. And then, and then if you've lived a fairly tame life, you're like, do I need to build my testimony, right? You ever, you ever been there? You ever thought that? When I was a junior high pastor, I had kids tell me all, that, all the time, like, well, my life's just so boring. I'm like, yeah, because your parents raised you right. That's your story. Tell it often. <laughs> but you don't need to build your testimony. There's too much pain in that. It's a cool video, yes, but there's a lot of pain that comes with it. It ain't worth it. But Mary Magdalene is, came to faith because Jesus cast demons out of her. A wild story, a wild reputation. The people in the town would have known her for her past history. And Jesus chose her to be the first he would appear to. But not only that, he would appear to Mary. But it's not Mary, the mother of Jesus, notice. It's Mary, the mother of James, because in this story, Jesus, Jesus has come back, and he is now king over the earth. And so her position and her identity has now changed. She is now a follower of Christ. She is the mother of James. Because that's not who Jesus is anymore. It continues. I also want to note, too, for those who don't know much about Jewish culture, this is what a lot of people who defend the faith, we call it apologetics, will point to as proof of the resurrection. If you are going to write a false story about a false Messiah that started ultimately what we would call a religion, and you were going to do that in a patriarchal society, do you know what you wouldn't start with? Your Messiah appearing to women, particularly women that don't have a position of power. You typically start with men in power, so the men in power can manipulate the story. Not here, because this is how Jesus decided to do it. And the others with them, end of verse 10, who told this to the apostles, but they did not believe the Woman, guys, this is going to be our verse for this year's men's retreat. (laughs) But they did not believe the women. Ladies, I see you taking a deep breath. I know. I get it. I get it. I'm sorry. The, The apostles just can't believe it. 
In fact, we'll go on to say, because their words seemed like nonsense. And you you got to be honest. <laughs> that guy better not laugh too loud. That's a, I mean, I'm just saying, you're, you're about to be kicked out of Easter party. I'm just kidding. No, I mean, but the, the truth is, this, this story would feel like nonsense. If somebody came up to you, you went to a funeral, and the person that you just witnessed the funeral for, or shoot, was at the graveside for, lowered them six feet under, and the next day you start to hear rumors of that, that person's alive, you know what you'd say? I need to see that for myself, wouldn't you? Anybody else? Anybody else? I'd need to see that for myself, for sure. There's no doubt. Not only that, but if, if you're in the crowd when you see Jesus get beat within inches of his life before he even gets to the cross, then he has to carry that heavy beam. I mean, the, the sacrifice that Jesus made and the pain that he endured, and to think, that guy? I, I feel like if I heard that somebody came back from the grave, I, I would probably think it was one of the bookend crosses. Because those guys didn't get beat quite like Jesus did. They weren't publicly mocked quite like Jesus did. They didn't have to carry the beam quite like Jesus did. Not, not with all the open wounds on the back. Not with the crown of thorns on their head. So I would have assumed it was one of the bookends. No, 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 no. You know, it was the guy in the middle. For sure the guy in the middle. Jesus, Nazareth. He's alive. No stinking way. I'd have to see it for myself. Well, watch what happens. There's only one of them that gets up. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself, what happened? So Peter didn't get an appearance, but Peter, through the rumors of the appearance, decided to run to the tomb himself. Another text said it became a race. And what I love in that one is it, is it mentions that Peter was last. So we know from this story that Peter ran to the tomb, but others did too, and Peter was the slowest, probably pulled a hammy on the way, right? But Peter runs right into the tomb. He's got to see it for himself. And he starts to hold the linens that Jesus' body laid in. And he's got to start to wonder. I wonder if at that point, all the things that Jesus had said to him weeks leading up to this moment started to play in his head. This can't be happening. The story will go on and, and Jesus will appear kind of in a mysterious way to some disciples on the road to Emmaus. We're going to skip that section and go to where he appears to the disciples. But what ends up happening as a result of him appearing first Jerusalem to the ladies and then to them telling the apostles, they don't believe him, but they start talking. And the rumors start scattering all throughout Jerusalem. Much like all through Jesus' ministry, three years of Jesus' ministry, he'll perform miracles and travel. And as he starts to perform more and more miracles, and the power becomes more and more evident that this guy's doing things that other people aren't doing. This guy's healing in ways that man cannot is either of God or is either of the of Satan and demons, and this is a power that is not natural, and so the rumors have been stirring from town to town to town, and here we go again. I mean, you 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 probably got sick of the Jesus rumors, but this was the latest, and this was the greatest. So on the road to Emmaus, he appears mysteriously. And all of a sudden he begins, verse 36, jump all the way down with me to his disciples. When you see what he says to them, it's what he says to everybody he appears to. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, I'm going to say it differently than you're reading. He said to them, shalom, which is translated in your Bible as what? Peace. Be with you. Shalom. They were startled and frightened. If you're taking notes, you can write just number two. It's the second mention of somebody being scared, thinking that they saw a ghost. This person can't be real. They're dead. They're six feet under. There's no way they're back. This has to be a hallucination. What was in my, what, what kind of mushrooms were in my breakfast this morning, right? That, that's what they're thinking. They're thinking that this is some hallucination of some sort. And watch Jesus' response to this. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do, you, do, why do doubts rise in your mind? Jesus' approach to the disciples is a little bit different for two reasons. One, because he has the relationship with them. 
Like, they, they've done life together. There's a brotherhood here. They've wept together. They've laughed together. They've done healings together. They've served people together. I mean, they, they've done life together. And so he's going to speak to them uh, in a matter-of-fact manner. Also because he's going to hand the baton to them in not too many days, 40 to be exact. He's going to hand the baton to them to start a movement that we now call the church. And he needs to make sure that they are ready. And if they're going to lead this movement, they're going to have to believe with everything in their being because it may very well cost them their life. Oh, and it did. Look, verse 39. Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. First, he appears to Mary, Joanna, and Mary. And then he appears to some of the disciples, right? One of those is a guy named Thomas who isn't there at the original scene. But we, we know him as what? As Doubting Thomas. And this story is alluding to him, not by name, but it's alluding to this, this point in the story where, where Thomas had to, even though Jesus is standing right in front of him, he needs to touch and feel and see. And it's just this reminder that wherever you're at in your faith journey, wherever you're at, if, if you were invited by somebody and you're here just to satisfy that invite, because you love that family member, you love that friend, wherever you're at on your faith journey, I'm sure you have questions, and so do I, to be quite frank. But wherever you're at in your faith journey, let me, let me tell you about the God that we're studying today. That God can handle your questions. The disciples that he led for three years had questions. After three years of physically being with him. Because that God can handle it. And he speaks to them. Touch and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as UFC. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Proof, proof. Proof, God is in the business of revealing truth. He's done it in scripture. He's done it in his presence. He's doing it in the church. He's doing it through his Holy Spirit. He's in the business of revealing truth. That's his goal. The Holy Spirit's goal is to guide us into all truth. Truth about who God is. Truth about why we're here. Truth about how we're supposed to interact with each other. Truth about how you're supposed to navigate that complicated situation that doesn't have a chapter and verse. Our God wants to reveal truth to us. He wants to bring clarity into the confusion. Verse 40. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they, were st while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have any thing here to eat. Don't you love that? That's so good. It's like, no, we still don't believe. All right, let's eat. If you're not going to believe, let's have a meal together. Maybe, maybe your confusion is just hanger. Maybe we get something in your belly, you'll figure this thing out. Or maybe, maybe because we've had so many meals together. That if you see me where you've always seen me, if you hear me where you've always heard me, if you experience me how you've always experienced me, you'll begin to recognize me. Let's grab a meal. It's such a human interaction between Jesus and the disciples. It was, it's what stands out in this faith and our faith amongst any other religion is the human reality of Jesus. They gave him a piece of broiled fish, the first ever Chick-fil-A. And he took it and ate it in their presence. I hope they had the sauce. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about, about me in the law of the Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. We would call this the Old Testament. Then he opened their mouths, their minds, so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. This is absolutely crucial because the faith for the Israelites, if they were not careful, were going to be, was going to be central to God's chosen nation. And God says, I didn't come 
through Jerusalem in order to just save Israel. The purpose of my death and my resurrection, it needs to go to the ends of the earth. Every tribe, tongue, and nation, my people that I've made, different colors and different cultures, every part of the world is where I'm going, and it's where this message needs to go. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. There's so much to unpack in this story, but if you're taking notes, you can get out your note sheet right now. We're just going to begin to unpack all the things that we just read. First, let's begin with the two common emotions we see in the resurrection story. There's two common emotions in the resurrection story, and that is fear and confusion. Fear and confusion. Fear is all over the place. Confusion is, you have to read a little bit into it. As you study in all four of the Gospels, in these appearances, you see some confusion, some doubt, some questions arise. It's common. The fright, the, the fright almost is immediate. The confusion happens over the conversation. Here, here's what's really, really interesting about fear and confusion. You know who's really easy to control? People who are scared and confused. You're like, where are you going with this? People are really easy to control when they're two things. When they're really scared and when they're really confused. And if they're really scared and really confused, well, my friends, get out the strings. Because you can make them do whatever you want. We've seen this all throughout history. Shoot, we've seen this in religion. We've seen this with uh, the law being added, man adding to the law, right, to try to control the population. We see it in the scriptures. One of Jesus' biggest beasts with the Pharisees is they're, them trying to control everybody. Instead of seeing the law through the love of God, they try to control We see it even after this resurrection story in the church. Unfortunately, our church history has a lot of religious aspects to it, right? Even even before the printing press, the Bible was chained to the pulpit. One, because there wasn't very many Bibles, but two, if people got access to the Bible, then they would know what's in it, and they could hold the teachers accountable to it. It's why it's so important that in this age of information, we have access to everything. We have access to so much information that we're not apathetic in knowing God's word on itself. It's why if I ever say anything up here that doesn't align with scripture, you have permission to walk up and challenge me on that because I am not the authority. The book is. God's word is. It's not my opinions that matter. Shoot, my life will come and go. So will the next guy. What has authority is God's word. Why? Because it's who he is revealed in a love story, in a love narrative about creator pursuing creation, even though they rebelled against him. And and in this story, we have Jesus appearing to multiple people. One, as I already covered, it's Mary, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of Jesus. Two is the disciples. And then we have Thomas, Three. There's some other names in here, but I'm summarizing a little bit. And then we get something really interesting written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth where it says Jesus appeared to 500 people. 500 people. And here's why this is important. Because in the defense of the faith, it's hard. It's easy for one, one person to lie. It'd be easy even for the 11 to lie. And, and you could even argue that there would be motivation for them to make up the story that Jesus came back from the grave. Shoot, they left their lives for it. Maybe over the last three days, right, you can make the argument, the last three days they've been bummed and depressed, and maybe Peter set up and said, I have an idea. Because that's what Peter did. And maybe he said, what if we just say that he came back from the grave? That's plausible, right? Ah. But Paul is stating boldly, Jesus didn't just appear to the women. He didn't just appear to the disciples. He appeared to a crowd of 500. You know what he said to them? Same thing he said to Mary, Joanna, and Mary. Same thing he said to the disciples. Same thing he said to Thomas. He said, Shalom. Peace be with you. Now let me ask you a question. 
especially the skeptics, just lean on in this moment. Just a question for you to think about. Submit to you for your consideration. If a fake Messiah shows up on a scene and you've got a bunch of scared and confused people, what's the last thing you should do? Bring peace to the situation. Why? Because scared and confused people, what? Are really easy to control. You see it in religion. You see it in government. If the government wants to seize power, what are they going to do? Fear? Confusion. Study the history books. Study the empires that have risen and fallen. Study the, the government structures that have oppressed the people. There's all different names, all different styles. What you'll see woven into the story as they seized power was confusing the people with propaganda and scaring them by demonizing one group of people. Why? Because scared and confused people are the easiest to control. And here we have a real Jesus showing up to the scene. Do you know what he doesn't need? Control. You know why? Because he's the sovereign God of the universe. So when he shows up to the scene to people he genuinely cares about, who he genuinely wants the best for, when he really sees fear, when he genuinely feels confusion, you know what he says? Shalom. Shalom. It's ironic. It's ironic that a fake Messiah would ever attempt to do that. It builds my confidence that the Jesus we're studying was the real deal. Not just his power, but all, also his approach. When he shows up on the scene, every single appearance begins with shalom. Because where his presence is, is where peace is found. And when you experience peace, do you know what you get? You get clarity. And when you have clarity, you know where to go. It's almost as if Jesus is saying, listen, I want you as clear of mind as possible so you can make the decision for yourself. I have all control, but I'm going to give you the decision on whether or not you want to follow that. But listen, first, shalom. Be clear-headed. Settle the noise in your heart. Get your soul at rest. See me. Let's have a meal together. Recognize me. I'm good. I am for you. I'm truth. You may not like everything I have to say, but I'm, 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 I see things you don't see. I know what you don't know, and I'm inviting you to follow me. That does mean you're going to have to lay down your life in order to follow me, but I'm going to give you a clear head in order to make that decision. Shalom. To the women in the story, shalom. To the disciples he lived with, shalom. To Thomas who doubted, shalom. To the crowd and to the masses, shalom. Peace. Be with you. We live in a day right now where we need some shalom. You and I need shalom. We need peace. And you may be asking, what, is it, what does that mean that Jesus takes away the storm? No, it means in the eye of it, he is with you. It means that because he's conquered the grave, that power that exists through faith in him, through the clarity of mind to decide to follow him and lay down your life and ultimately follow in his footsteps and allow the dust of that rabbi to cover you, right? So that when God looks at you, he doesn't look at your sin. He doesn't look at your mistakes. He, he sees actually Jesus because he stands in your place. My friends, the, the, the open tomb means that God is alive today in this place right now. He has risen. Shalom is available to you. To every single one of you. You don't know what I've done. Welcome to the club. Get your sin resume out. Compare it to the guy or girl next to you. Maybe yours is a little longer. Maybe yours is a little thicker. Maybe you could fill a novel. 
Maybe your whole encyclopedia. Today, the offering to you on Easter Sunday, 2023, is the same offering he makes to everybody in this story. Shalom, with a clear mind, are you willing to follow the one who has all control? Are you willing to settle the fear, to settle the confusion, and ultimately become in a relationship, in an intimate relationship with the one that knows you best, who knows you best? You know why? Because he made you. He knows your mind. He knows your heart. He knows your soul. He knows the parts of you physically that you hate, right? When you stand in your mirror, you're like, why don't you give me this mole? He's like, because I wanted to. And he likes you. After all, he designed you. But in the way of you and him, in the way of me and him before I've placed my faith in him, in the way of all of us, not a person that's ever walked this earth didn't have something between them and God. Because God is holy and perfect and set apart In the way of us, creation and creator, is our sin, is our rebellion. And we have to come to this place with a clear mind and a clear heart and ask ask as many questions as you have to. This is a great place. We always say, wrestlers welcome. Just leave the singlets at home. You can wrestle with whatever question you have. Nobody got that joke? We'll try it again next service. (laughs) Wrestlers welcome. Wrestle with the faith here. You can belong far before you believe. Because that was the heart of Jesus in the story. See my hands. See my feet. Experience my power and my friends. What you really need is shalom. Because if we start to leave this place changed with shalom in our hearts, then we can start to begin to bring shalom to places of chaos in our world. Listen, part of the, the divide right now that exists, and I'm not, I'm, not talking, I'm not talking left and right, I'm talking heaven and hell. Part of the divide that exists right now is pure chaos. We see hell all over the place on earth. And, and, and as Christians, we get to bring a taste of heaven to the places of hell here on earth. But do you know where you need that first? First, you need that in your own heart. First, you need that in your own soul. And once you have it in your own heart and in your own soul, then you get to bring it to the places of hell here on earth. God's saying, you're the plan. To the ends of the earth, and you're the plan. To the ends of your neighborhood, and you're the plan. To the ends of your workplace, you're the plan. To the end of the baseball diamond, you're the plan. Everywhere you go, you're the plan. But you first have to have shalom in your own heart. You first have to have shalom in your own soul. So my friends, with a clear mind, with a clear heart, on Easter 2023, will you accept the presence of God that stands before you today and and ultimately claim victory because he has risen. So God, we come before you this morning. We thank you for who you are. Sometimes life feels chaotic. It feels fast. It feels loud. It feels busy. I can only imagine how it felt for the disciples and those who loved you the day after your death. But God, we experience aspects of our life like that now. Diagnosis that are unsettling and scary. There's people who lose their jobs and are scared of how they're going to provide for their families. There's disruptions in relationships. There's hurt and trauma. Not only have we contributed to sin, but God, we also have been sinned against. And in all of that, Lord, much of our lives are lived with so much fear 
and so much confusion, making us vulnerable to be controlled by other aspects other than you. So we come before you on Easter 2023. And we say thank you that the God who is in control seeks to settle the noise in our hearts, settle the noise in our minds, to guide us into truth, and ultimately fill us with your love so that we could be a light in a dark world, so that we could be a hope where there is none, so we could ultimately show up to places of chaos, and say what you said to us. Shalom. May your peace be with us. May your presence fill this room. May we feel you on this Easter Sunday. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.